I'm Walter Bosley, author of Origin, the 19th century emergence of the 20th century breakaway civilizations. Available print on demand only at lulu.com. This selection is from chapter eight of the book. Goldfingers, Source and Sorcery, and Sir Richard Francis Burton. There is a story to be told about the search for the lost technology of forgotten civilizations in the Americas, and I have attempted to tell part of it in three books. This search is the running theme of my Secret Mission series, but it's also discussed in Empire of the Wheel 2, Friends from Sonora. However, my most specific research into that quest in South America concerns the mysterious missing months in the annals of British explorer-scientist Sir Richard Francis Burton. In Empire of the Wheel 2, Friends from Sonora, I briefly present the basic history of German gold hunting activities of the 19th century in South America, specifically within a context to illuminate what I suspect was active though covert NIMSA participation in that venture. In Secret Missions 2, The Lost Expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton, the data implies that the legendary British explorer scientist and intelligence officer could have been collecting on Prussian, read that NIMSA, activities while in South America. Burton went there over three decades prior to Butch and Sundance and the most mysterious period of his life, the only period about which he published not a word, following a few years as British consul in Brazil. What do I think Burton was doing during the four months that are blank in his journals and books? I explore that in great detail in Secret Missions 2, The Lost Expedition, and it directly involved the very things we've discussed earlier in this book, The Lost Technology of the Forgotten Civilization, the very reason I think NIMSA was deployed to South America in the first place. At the time of Burton's Lost Expedition, the Sonora Aero Club had been dissolved for a decade. The U.S. Civil War was over. America was in reconstruction, and the Aeron project would have been in early development. Prussian influence in Mexican politics had ended badly with the execution of French-backed Austrian Maximilian, thus resulted the aforementioned shift to South America. With German immigration established, Prussian agents could move freely about the immense southern continent without raising any eyebrows. Though it is true that the immigration had begun in the early 19th century, the major flow of Germans into South America would not really pick up until the gold standard was implemented with the establishment of gold mark currency in 1871. This coincidentally places Burton in the areas of interest just a couple of years prior, which is why I suspect the gold issue to have been part of his proposed classified assignment. I propose that NIMSA activity immediately preceded the German gold standard decision and subsequent German involvement in the South American gold rushes of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Prussian interest in Inca gold secrets would have led NIMSA agents to investigate some of the same sites Burton was known to be looking for, and especially those which I think he investigated secretly on behalf of both British intelligence and his secret society masters. Why? In the minds of those in pursuit of the forgotten civilizations and their lost technology, these South American sites would likely reveal either the locations of hidden ancient mining operations or the method by which the forgotten civilization manufactured, yes, physically produced, gold itself. Indeed, I am suggesting alchemy on an industrial scale. This excerpt is from my Burton book. But suppose the story of the queen hiding the gold was true in allegory. What if the hiding of the gold in subterranean passages is code for the knowledge of from where to draw the gold? Based on the failed search for El Dorado, we can safely assume that the Spanish never found it. But what if the story of hidden vaulted gold has nothing to do with a place as much as it does a process? Just as the megalithic sites and the lore of the tunnels are associated with the mysterious lost civilization, I propose that so too was the source of the Inca gold. As David Childress compellingly argues for a massive Tiwanaku Pumapunku ore processing complex, I am willing to take it a step further. Pumapunku and its associated Tiwanaku facility operated as a machine, not simply for the processing of ores, but for the raw production 
the chemical creation of gold. I realize what a colossal leap that will be for some to even consider, but I maintain that the proposition that the Inca gold had been a product of a much older civilization's gold-making machine we know as Puma Punku is valid. I also argue that NIMSA agents would have suspected this was the case with Puma Punku certainly as much as did the secret society, which I contend sent Burton on his expedition. NIMSA was created and managed by men who possessed and were dedicated to further gaining arcane knowledge every bit as much as they were to forging industry and founding a unified Germany, as I have pointed out already. So now let's explore what they might have known specifically. NIMSA in Latin America, what the Prussians knew. What did the Prussians of the early to mid 19th century know of South America's ancient secrets? How might this have directly influenced or have been influenced by NIMSA? We may not be able to answer that question directly, but we might surmise from known activity that Prussian German explorers were in the right places to likely have learned a few things about South America's lost past. It is very important to note here that not one of these explorers had to actually have even been aware of an organization like NIMSA. The organization would only have needed access to the data, if not an embedded agent on the various expeditions, which employ many people other than the identified scientific team, including porters, cooks, hunters, etc. NIMSA could have been on their expeditions without anyone's knowledge. So which explorers could have been either NIMSA sources, agents, or unwitting enablers? Alexander von Humboldt is a good starting point. Born in 1769, Berlin native Humboldt studied at the University of Frankfurt, then Göttingen, where his passion for travel was ignited. As a result, he dedicated his studies and life to scientific exploration. Humboldt's Latin American explorations began in Venezuela in the summer of 1799. He followed this with a four-month journey down the Orinoco River system and from there to Cartagena, and eventually onto the Amazon for Lima, Peru. Humboldt's South American explorations resulted in the essential foundations of modern geography and meteorology, and in this we find our resonance with NIMSA interests. What I think Humboldt contributed most specifically to NIMS's interest, possibly, is to be found in his work on the Earth's magnetic field. It was he who discovered that the planet's magnetic field decreases in intensity when moving from the poles toward the equator. The importance of this to NIMSA would be obvious if the airships truly did require tapping into the world energy grid of telluric current and magnetic forces, this information would be vital to the organization's flight operations in South America. Technical compensations and adjustments would need to be made for the craft to fly in a weaker field. Another aspect of Humboldt's early 19th century explorations of South America was geology. Humboldt's study of volcanoes revealed linear grouping in them and, as he presumed, corresponded with vast subterranean fissures. In this do we find the source for the creation of large, open subterranean chambers, leading to the legends of tunnels and hollow earth stories linked to the esoteric lore of ancient South America? NIMSA would definitely have been interested in these results of Humboldt's work. I think it's reasonable that NIMSA would have gone into its South American venture armed with Humboldt's data. Might Humboldt have been a NIMSA player? Why not? As I argue in another book that a secret hermetic society recruited Burton, why wouldn't the men behind NIMSA have recruited from among the brightest in the German universities? It's possible that Humboldt was among the early NIMSA associates, but whether Humboldt was NIMSA or not, his South American work would have been available to them by 1804, decades before the Sonora Aero Club emerged in California. Perhaps NIMSA took benefit from or even had a hand in the Austrian expedition to Brazil, which operated from 1817 to 1835 and included two German scientists and an Italian specialist in hieroglyphs among its prominent roster. This expedition was commissioned by Rhenish Prince Clemens Wenzel von Metternich and linked to Dom Pedro IV, descendant of the Portuguese monarch of the Manuscript 512 tale. 
Might Dom Pedro, whose ancestor was denied the lost mines of Murabeca, have hoped the Austrian expedition would find the riches promised by Roberto Diaz two centuries prior? Certainly Nimzo would have been curious about circumstances involving lost mines in Brazil and thus could have placed Germans on the expedition. Was sponsor Prince Wenzel of Metternich a Nimza associate? When Metternich was exiled during a revolutionary period, he went to Amsterdam and then to London, both cities known to be Venetian bankster strongholds, according to Joseph Farrell. After his return to Austria, Metternich hobnobbed with Otto von Bismarck for the entire summer of 1851. The company Metternich kept might suggest a Nimza association to some degree, thus we must consider such an influence on the expedition decades prior. German-Russian explorer George Heinrich von Langsdorff, who studied at Göttingen, participated in or led expeditions through Brazil between 1813 and 1822, and then again in 1826, specifically focusing on the Amazon region and the Minas Gerais, the locale of much of the lost city lore, and returning in 1829 to Rio de Janeiro. The journals of his scientific data and his log were supposedly lost in the archives for a hundred years, and their rediscovery revealed that much of Langsdorff's focus was on geography and ethnography, two disciplines of obvious value to a group like Nimza in search of lost civilizations and the lore of forgotten cultures. If there was a candidate for Nimza field operative, it could have been Robert Herman Schomburg. This Prussian-born adventurer emigrated to the United States and became a successful merchant, but his interest soon fell to shipwrecks and exploration. Having impressed the Royal Geographical Society with a self-financed survey of the Virgin Isles, Schomburg was sent by them to lead a four-year expedition through British Guiana, the results of which led to determination of border boundaries between several South American nations. He went on to serve in diplomatic positions for Britain and continued geographical explorations in Thailand and the Dominican Republic. He was an honored servant of England. But Schomburg has been identified as a Knight of the Prussian Order of the Red Eagle, which is usually bestowed only upon commissioned military officers or their civilian equivalents. Alexander von Humboldt's brother Wilhelm was a Knight First Class of this order, and a Grand Cross Knight was the Prussian ambassador of the aforementioned Dom Pedro II of Brazil. However, the rosters fail to show Schomburg among their ranks. It would be interesting to know the origin of this alleged association from the perspective of potential Nimza interest in Schomburg. Might he have been a clandestine agent? Another possible Nimza source, if not agent, might have been Karl von den Steinen. Born in Mulheim, Steinen was a German psychiatrist who focused on anthropology, particularly of the cultures of central Brazil. Steinen was an avid explorer between 1879 and 1898, participating in a circumnavigation of the world, a polar year expedition to South Georgia, and the first two expeditions into the Zingu region of Brazil. He also journeyed to the Marquesas Islands in the South Pacific. Steinen's work was focused most keenly on ancient languages of tribal cultures and of their art. Was he looking for evidence of the lost civilization? Did Nimza learn anything from his work that they might have used during the early 20th century period of their operations in South America? August Kapler was a German-born naturalist who spent many years in South America, where he also served in the Dutch colonial service in Suriname, which he subsequently explored for 33 years. He returned to Germany and is buried in Stuttgart. Hugo Zoller was a German journalist explorer whose world travels included South American expeditions in 1881 and 1882, which resulted in two books. Wilhelm Sievers was a professor of geography at the University of Gießen. He explored Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, and Peru between 1884 and 1909 and wrote six books on these travels. Sievers' time in South America spanned that period we will be looking at later, the first decade of the 20th century. Among the most prominent NIMSA candidates of the late 19th century was Arthur Poznanski, whose work has a direct bearing on the investigation of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku. Poznanski was born in Vienna in 1873 and educated at the Imperial and Royal Academy of Pula for a subsequent naval career. His father was an industrial chemist, which places Poznanski within the reach of the Nimza milieu. 
His interest in archaeology was inspired on a naval voyage that took him to the South Pacific where he visited Easter Island. By the age of 23, Poznanski left Europe for South America. Poznanski explored the Brazilian Amazon and got himself involved in military actions that forced him to move to Bolivia. Spending much of his time there exploring the highlands and neighboring Peru, Poznanski was fascinated with ancient Inca sites, especially around Lake Titicaca. He won national medals for his archaeological and ethnologic writings and even became director of the National Museum. Poznanski would become a popular lecturer in Berlin, Frankfurt, Nuremberg, and the German government awarded him an honorary title of professor in 1914. Poznanski's most active period of exploration spanned my proposed Nimza gold hunting era as well as the 1890s airship mystery period. My point in looking at these German explorers of South America is that there was much Prussian activity down there throughout the 19th century. With all the Lost Civilization Association, it stands to reason that the Prussian Nimza would have a stake in such exploration, if not a guiding hand. I shall reiterate that whether these men were associated with Nimza or not, their works would have served Nimza interests. I again propose that it's certainly possible that any of them could have been Nimza agents. So what might Nimza have gained from all of the 19th century German expeditions? Where to look for gold and relics, along with data vital to mechanical operations of the airships. These expeditions mostly revealed where Nimza explorers could subsequently find sites associated with the lost civilization, which I think they did. Is there any evidence that Nimza airships ever flew in South America? Origin, the 19th century emergence of the 20th century breakaway civilizations, is available print-on-demand only at lulu.com.